Now, I will be uh, mentioning an event that's taking place There's tomorrow. There's a police spokesman, Al O'Leary, 06. Hello, I am Mario Vargas Llosa, and you are listening to New York News Radio now. 26 minutes, 27 seconds. Oh, boy, we're rolling. Okay, I'm not sure. Hi, public is not. It's difficult to think of a U.S. counterpart to my first guest here on New York and Company, and maybe we don't even have one. Elena Poniatowska is a Mexican writer whose account of the 1968 massacre in Mexico City established her as a prominent voice of conscience for her proud and troubled country. Deeply involved in the lives of the powerless and the poor, her books of journalism, fiction, and essays have made her the most prominent woman writer in Mexico and spectacularly popular as well. She's in town to give a free lecture at Barnard College tomorrow, and I'm thrilled that event has given me the opportunity to talk with her today. Good Thank afternoon. you. Uh, we're not likely to fi find many Poniatowskas in the Mexico City phone book, are we? No. Uh, but you, you were, your mother was Mexican? My mother was Mexican. Her name is Amor, which means love. And all her family on my mother's side, is they're all Mexican. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but you were brought up in France, I and was you spoke French until you were eight years old. Yes. And yes. then you went, you went to Mexico when you were eight or nine? I went to Mexico when I was eight, and uh, I arrived in Mexico and uh, stayed there until I went to a, a school, a school in Philadelphia mm -hmm. called Eden Hall in Torresdale, a little town where there was just the, the train station. Then a madhouse, the convent, a sacred heart convent, the Catholic convent, and then a jail. <laughs> and then a jail? Yes, that was all there was. Uh, that was the whole town. Yes. Well, but so here you are speaking French for the first part of your life, and very quickly after learning Spanish, coming to the United States and speaking English. Yes. And yet you write not only in Spanish, but you write in a Spanish that is very accomplished. Uh, did you pick up all that, that wonderful Spanish that we read uh, in just that brief time that you spent between France and the United States? No, I was just, I was never taught Spanish because at, the, at my house we used to speak French and never, never, we ne so I was taught Spanish by the people in the streets. Mm -hmm. But it's not very, my Spanish is not very wonderful, it's very popular. Oh, so that's the reason why it seems rich and full of life to the the outsider because it isn't the the Spanish of somebody who went to the best universities. <laughs> yes. <perhaps>. Uh, <laughs> but, but it's not atypical, is it, for people in Mexico to to reject the the Mexican side? Uh, rich people. In fact, until recently, there were hardly any decent Mexican restaurants in Mexico City because everybody went out to French restaurants or fancy Spanish restaurants, Italian yes. restaurants. Mexican food was considered kind of lower class, even though it's such a rich heritage. Was it? No, but in, Mex in, uh, in, in my house, I remember we ate Mexican food and loved it. Because the maids made it. Yes. Uh, but then, but you, still, you still thought of yourself, or your parents thought of themselves as being more cosmopolitan than just what was going on around them? Oh, yes. My, fa my mother speaks Spanish with a very strong French, French accent. Mm -hmm. she, doesn't ca she cannot pronounce the R, she says. Uh, Este rápido rueda las ruedas del ferrocarril. She can't see. She can't say the R. Uh -huh. She and says it in French. And people hear yes. that immediately, of course. Yes. Uh, which puts her in a in an exalted position, or do people uh, have a certain amount of, of contempt for somebody who can't speak Spanish like? A, a local? Well, they, no, I don't think they have any contempt. Now uh, Mexico is very cosmopolitan, so they are used to everything. Mm -hmm. Well, you, uh, you wound up because you learned Spanish on the streets, getting very involved with the sensibility of the streets. Even yes. though you were, you were living in this kind of rarefied atmosphere, you actually saw yourself as, as a woman of the people from the start? Yes, I did, always. As a little girl, I cared a lot about their stories, what they told me, and all the magic in their stories, and all the uh, magical realism all of Garcia, that Garcia Marquez put in a book. No? Mm -hmm. And for me, it was very extraordinary, especially being a, l a little French girl. No? 
coming from Paris and everything I saw was so crazy and so new that I loved it. Because Mexico is really unlike any other country in the world, although we uh, here we don't realize it, but this is a country that merges not only uh, pre-Columbian cultures with Spanish, but also there are French influences, there are English influences, Chinese influences, yes. a lot of influence from the United States, making it uh, a, an amalgam unlike anywhere else in the world. Yes, it is. Uh, and one that would be fascinating to an outsider uh, who is trying to become an insider? Yes. Yes, well, I, I feel I'm an insider. Mm -hmm. You also, you also uh, worked for a while with Oscar Lewis. So there was an anthropological side there? Yes, I worked for him, with him for two months, or for him. And he, but they used to think he was a doctor at the vecindades where he went. So they used to think that he was a doctor that was going to cure them. S and he was only, of course, a doctor in anthropology, but he didn't want to disappoint them. So when they said Dr. Cito, he kept aspirins and giving them <laughs> uh, things like that so they would be happy. And I worked with him, and he had opera. I remember he sang opera and uh, had opera lessons. He was a very good and wonderful man. But he had all his inform informants come to see him. Mm -hmm. He didn't go out to the people. Yes, he did oh. sometimes. Uh, did, so he influenced you on one hand, and then the stories of the people influenced you on the other hand. But would that make for a good reporter? Well, what makes a good reporter, I think, is curiosity. And, uh, and besides, one thing that I was very much uh, is ingenuity, mm -hmm. to ask very stupid questions. Right now, you, as a reporter, as a journalist, you have to be going through one of the richest times in your life, if one of the saddest. Mm -hmm. When you arrived in Mexico, uh, there was a kind of a golden age happening. And not only were there all those famous painters, Diego Rivera, Orozco, uh, Siqueiros, Tamayo, uh -huh. but Luis Buñuel was making movies, and yes. a lot of other famous filmmakers were there. It was a very, it, there were a lot of emigres from, from Europe who'd yes. come by to enrich the culture that was already rich. Uh -huh. uh, that was a great time. Mm -hmm. And now we have a, a country that looks almost like a... a Right now, I was going through the worst kind of political melodrama you could imagine. Two political assassinations, a revolt, uh, the peso falling fast, uh, a, a political party in total disarray, the ruling party. Yes. Uh, <laughs> is, this, is this a good or a bad time for a journalist? I think it's a wonderful time for a journalist, but I think it's also a very difficult time for a Mexican now because as, I, I, as a Mexican, I feel very ashamed of my country, but not of the country in it himself, but very ashamed of the president we chose and very ashamed of what is happening. And Which president are you talking about, Salinas or Zedillo? Salinas. Uh, who's now been forced, after a, a, a momentary hunger strike, to flee the country. Yes. To, to go to Boston to be with his children who are at Harvard. Uh, yes. So that's an embarrassment as well. But for a Mexican, I think it's very embarrassing, no? And very sad. Mm -hmm. You uh, have covered the story in Chiapas. Uh, I, what I get to hear is a, a sense that for a time there was a very strong, uh, the people felt in support of the Zapatistas and now are no longer in support of them. Uh, what is your feeling? No, I think that people are still in support of the Zapatistas because in so many years, I think uh, Subcomandante Marcos or Marcos has been the, the best thing we, we have had. For instance, uh, in, a, in a country where there is so much corruption, he, we can believe at least in one person. And, we, and young people are always looking at people they can believe in. So he seems to, he doesn't tell lies. He's the person he says he is. He wears, of course, a ski mask, no? But hasn't he been unmasked recently? Yeah, yeah, well, yes, I think the people that work with him, it's very hot, you know, in the jungle there. They see him without a mask all the time, and I think he's very willing to take off this mask. But now people tell him not to take it off because it's the way it makes him a character, no? It's his characterization. And besides, it's his way of winning over the government, no? Mm -hmm. But I think all people, all good Mexicans, well, I, I, it's not as simple as that, but all people really love him. Well, there was a propaganda campaign against him, wasn't there? Oh, yes, there is. There's, m the rich people hate him, and the people in the government, they hate him. You were granted a rare interview with... Yes, yes, he Marcus. wrote me a letter telling me to come and see him. So I took my two children, 
my two, uh, my boy and a girl, a photographers, and we all went there. We stayed with him. And really, it was, for me, it was a lesson. And for my children, it was very, very good because they changed. They were very bourgeois children, you know, a little bit spoiled. And now they're completely zapatistas. And my girl, uh, she was there building the library. I mean, putting all the books into the library. And then the library was burnt by the, the army. So you're not an objective journalist. You're not somebody like Octavio Paz who, d who says, I don't belong to any political. No, I'm not objective. I've, I've, I've never been. <laughs> From the start? From the when start. Well, in the early days, what you, you started off writing uh, society columns? Yes. <laughs> so and were, I, were it you, was very critical? dull. I was not objective at all, and I, I, I didn't like it at all. And what I had, if, for instance, the things I had to do was, besides writing, for instance, uh, fix the pictures. So if the ladies wore skirts that were too high, I had to paint a little strip, you know, to put it down. <laughs> you painted Things like them as well, well really? I painted them as well, and I didn't like it. And then I started making jokes like the ugliest woman, the ugliest hat, because in 1954, they wrote, in 1953 when I started, they wear, they wore, they wore, mm -hmm. they wore hats and things like that. So I, I started making fun, of, so they took me out. And then you wound up being given what, I mean, I know what it's like to interview people, I read that you interviewed a person a day. Yes. For, for how many years? For a year, just a year, and 365 you wrote up each interview? days. Yes, but there were small interviews, uh -huh. and very stupid ones. But oh. at least I went to see one person a day. But uh, I was very lucky because I became friends with Luis Buñuel and Diego Rivera and Octavio Paz and Carlos Fuentes and people like that. Why do you think that Mexico has lost its luster? That was such a, a hopeful time. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, we, we have the same political party in power. If anything, Mexico has gotten a little richer because oil was found. Uh -huh. So here we are uh, with seeing a country go into serious decline since those days. Well, I think that there's also in history a law of balance, no? Sometimes the balance is high, sometimes it's very low. We are at our, our, at, at our lowest point. But I think that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Subcomandante Marcos is just like Emiliano Zapata, no? And Emiliano Zapata was supposed to be the highest point of, me of Mexican life because it was the revolution. So if on one side we are on the very lowest because of corruption and because of the burglars we have in the government, on the other side we have this international figure who means a lot, not only to Mexico, but I think to all young people. When did you start becoming politicized? Was it very early or was it as you started writing books and covering events like the, the massacre of 19? I think I, I started when I started walking in the streets and so seeing so many people uh, so different and so so very, very poor, so many beggars. But that sounds very sentimental. But I really got very politicized in 1968. Mm -hmm. In 1968? Yes, when, the uh, students' movement. There was a student movement. There was soon to be an Olympics, yes, right? Yes. And students were in this, in this plaza where they were cut off. Yes. And, and like Tiananmen Square in many ways, yes. the government moved in and massacred I don't know how many people. Well, the Guardian in London, the, the newspaper said it was about 380 people, but I don't know exactly how many how many, we, we've we never known it. And besides, something very queer has happened because we've never been able to establish more than 30 names of young people that were killed. Mm -hmm. Among them, uh, 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 a woman, a young girl, uh, uh, of, of whom novels have been made, uh, called Regina Teutscher Kruger. Mm -hmm. Your brother was also there. Wasn't but he wasn't killed there, mm -hmm. no. But he was, Involved in the, the yes, as a young boy, well. yes, he he took part. Your your book uh, on that event is called La Noche de Platel, Plataloco. Yes, fine, uh, you said very well. No waddle words that are very difficult to say. In when it was translated into English, it was called Massacre in Mexico. Yes, interestingly, in in a country that where you would imagine this would be a great embarrassment, 
you won all sorts of awards. You be <laughs> you became even more famous. Yes, imagine how it's ve very queer because, for instance, after two years that when the book was published, they told me that President Echeverria was going to give me a prize called this Javier Villa Urrutia. So I said this was no book for no prize. No. I